Good morning, uh, bonjour. Welcome to Shirk's Big Thinking Discussion on Imagining Canada's Future. My name is Giselle Yasmin. I'm Vice President Research at uh, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Je suis ravie uh, d'animer le groupe de discussion aujourd'hui. L'échange d'idées entre certains des plus grands penseurs du Canada promet d'être dynamique et intéressant. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to congratulate the Canadian Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences and our hosts at Wilfrid Laurier University and the University of Waterloo on an outstanding Congress program. We at Shirk are truly pleased to be involved and we invite uh, you to also join us at our booth in the Expo Zone where my colleagues will be happy to speak to you uh, about our programs and recent initiatives. This morning's session is the first in a two-part discussion here at Congress on the topic of Canada's future challenge areas. I'd like to invite those of you who are interested in continuing and deepening this morning's discussions to join us later today for our session entitled, Thinking Ahead, What Will Canada Look Like in 2030? Where John McFarlane, editor and co-publisher of The Walrus Magazine, will moderate a discussion with Canada research chairs and their students. It should be a great session. Since its founding in 1977, Shirk has invested proactively in areas of interest to Canadians, their well-being, and their future. In our strategic plan, framing our direction 2010 to 2012, we committed to renewing our current priority funding areas, which are currently environmental issues, northern communities, Aboriginal research, the digital economy, and innovation leadership and prosperity, while continuing to fund social sciences and humanities research on a broad range of topics. From this commitment came our initiative, Imagining Canada's Future. We're taking a forward-looking approach, casting ahead, to look at what future challenge areas might be for Canada in an evolving global context in the next 5, 10, and 20 years, and to which the social sciences and humanities research community could contribute its talent, knowledge, and expertise. We're committed to using a formal foresight methodology. This is not forecasting or prediction. I really want to underscore that. But this is about engaging the research community, its partners across the public, private, and not-for-profit sectors and beyond, to look at how the social sciences and humanities uh, research community could contribute to understanding, shaping, and preparing for multiple contingent futures that could possibly happen, and to also have a, a, a say in terms of uh, where we might want uh, the, uh, the future of this country to go. This will take us through to March 2013. The objective of both today's sessions is to gather insights from a var wide variety of sources to inform this forward-looking initiative. Our panelists this morning represent a wide variety of backgrounds and perspectives, and we're delighted to have them with us. Welcome. First, you'll be hearing from Dan Gardner. Uh, Dan Gardner is an award-winning columnist and senior writer at the Ottawa Citizen. His work has garnered numerous honors, including the National Newspaper Award, the Michener Citation of Merit, the Canadian Association of Journalists Award, and the Amnesty International Canada Media Award. Dan's best-selling book, Risk, the Science and Politics of Fear, was published in 11 countries and seven languages. Wow, and won the 2009 Canadian Science Writers Association Science in Society Prize. His latest book, Future Babel, has received rave reviews for its critical and thoughtful examination of future-oriented analyses. So he'll set the stage. Uh, second, Don Tapscott is one of the world's leading authorities on innovation, media, and the economic and social impact of technology. He is CEO of the Tapscott Group and the chairman of the think tank Moxie Insight, and is also vice chair of Spencer Trask Collaborative Innovations. Don has authored numerous books about information technology in business and society, including Macroeconomics, Rebooting Business and the World, and Wikonomics, How Mass Collaboration Changes Everything, an international bestseller on, in the New York Times and Business Week uh, bestseller lists. And last, certainly, but last but certainly not least, Diana Carney comes to us from Canada 2020, a nonpartisan policy think tank where she is vice president of projects. Among the projects Diana is responsible for is the Canada we want in 2020. And you'll see that uh, Diana has generously donated a number of copies of, of their study, which are available outside. Uh, as you can see, this is a very interesting project in terms of one that we're looking at closely in terms of our own work uh, here at SHRC. 
Uh, the Canada we want in 2020 is an ambitious, ongoing, multi-phased uh, project that seeks to launch a national conversation on the role of the federal government in key strategic areas for Canada. Diana is originally from the UK and her background includes work in consulting and overseas development. Je vous remercie de vous être joint à nous aujourd'hui. Nous avons beaucoup de chance d'avoir uh, pu vous compter parmi nous et d'avoir uh, entendu vos différents points de vue, lesquels contribuent à la ré ré réalisation de ce projet. Before we start the discussion, let me outline the format today's session will take. We'll start by asking each of our panelists to take 10 minutes or so to share their perspectives, to tell us what they think about the challenges that lie ahead. What are the issues, in your view, that Canada Canadians will be ta talking about, thinking about, and grappling with in 5, 10, 20 years? Then we'll have half an hour or so in which the panelists will take some time to respond to and perhaps expand on each other's statements. At that point, I'd like to ask Shirk's President Chad Gaffield, who is with us this morning, to take a moment to open the question session with his perspective on what we will have heard. From there, we'll open the floor to discussion. And if there are any uh, tweeps, or tweeters in the audience today, feel free to expand on the discussion using, using the hashtag uh, Future Canada ou bien Futur Canada en français, and we'll be trying to pick up some of those questions. And please note as well that there's a microphone in the center of the room. We would ask you to use that for the Q&A so that all can be heard in attendance. And we also have, for those with mobility issues, we do have a, a more uh, mobile uh, type microphone. With that, I'll pass it over to you, Dan. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Um, I hope and nobody minds if I walk a little bit. I need to gesticulate. Uh, right, since we're talking about the future and since I'm a pathological contrarian, I will start by talking about history. Uh, specifically 1962. Does anybody recognize this book? Profiles of the Future, Arthur C. Clarke. Lots of heads nodding. Excellent, excellent. The esteemed scientist, science fiction writer, wonderful man, wonderful book. Published in 1962, uh, it's a collection of essays. This is Arthur C. Clarke grappling with an exercise not unlike what we're doing here. And I want to read a little bit here. This is from the introduction. This is the first sentence of the, first, of the introduction. It is impossible to predict the future, and all attempts to do so in any detail appear ludicrous within a very few years. And then he goes on to say, the purpose of this book is to f take a look at the array of possible futures, to ask ourselves how we might come to more desirable futures and avoid less desirable futures. It's all perfectly sensible, rational stuff. It's the sort of thing that we all say when we talk about these exercises. But then something curious happens. Let me flip forward 43 pages. And you hear that apparently we're all about to run out of oil. The gasoline engine. Uh, it's no more. The car very soon will be no more. The future, and by the future, Clark means in the 1990s. The future of transportation belongs to anybody in the 1990s. We'll all be driving what? Hovercraft. <laughs> How many of you arrived by hovercraft this morning? <laughs> now that's extraordinary, isn't it? This is a genuinely brilliant man who has entirely and correctly identified the fact that when we're talking about long-range, big-scale forecasting, we can't do it. Uh, I've got loads and loads of examples in my book. They're all very humorous. By the way, I, I, I spend a lot of time reading old forecasts. It's, it's perversely enjoyable. <laughs> uh, he correctly identifies that. He says, I'm going to do something else entirely, and then he predicts the future. And he proves that, in fact, his first sentence about how they appear ludicrous inevitably it was correct. OK? Why? Why does that happen? And what I would suggest to you is this. We have, uh, well, the, hang on a second. Let me get my notes here. Uh, <laughs> we have, well, there's a couple of reasons. OK, first, right. The one I forgot. Explanatory stories. I was having a Rick Perry moment there. I have three priorities, and I just can't remember what they are. Uh, explanatory stories. The brain is a marvelous thing, right? We're compulsive explainers. We can easily, easily come up with some framework which will allow us to construct a story about the future 
which will seem deeply plausible. Nothing could be easier for me than to tell you about what will happen with the price of oil and how the price of oil will in fact determine the future. Nothing could be easier for me than to stand up here and tell you about what will happen with the Chinese economy and how that will determine Canada's fate. We are compulsive storytellers. We want the answer and we'll always have an explanation for why we have the answer and of course we're correct and it will feel true. And the flip side of that compulsion is our aversion to uncertainty. We really don't like not knowing. We really don't like saying, maybe, I don't know. Right? Harry Truman once famously said he wanted to hear from a one-armed economist because he was sick of hearing on the one hand on the other hand. <laughs> That's human nature. And so what happens is when we engage in these exercises and we look forward and we start from the very good proposition that we cannot forecast the future and we should look at a wide array of future and all these other sensible caveats, is that the sensible caveats are routinely left at the wayside and we convince ourselves that we actually do know what's coming. That's dangerous. That's a mistake. And we can make some serious mistakes, do some serious damage if we fall for that. Um, so very quickly, I'll just add a few more points. Based upon, I've spent a lot of time studying forecasting and studying these sorts of mistakes. Uh, the first thing I would say is this. Expunge the words certain and impossible from your vocabularies. Nothing is certain or impossible, not even death or taxes. Okay? Probability, what that means is, of course, you've just removed zero and 100%. Everything is only a probabilistic judgment, right? It's always between 1 and 99%. And in fact, it's actually useful when forecasting to try and force yourself, because it takes discipline to do this, to engage in assigning a numerical probability. You say, oh, I think this is very likely. Very likely is vague. Try to put a number on it. That forces you to think hard about it. Another problem, when you try to do that, when you try to put a number on things, when you try to make those sort of subjective judgment probability calls, we know from the research that you'll almost certainly be overconfident. In fact, when people say in the confidence research, when they say they are 100% confident that something is true, there's no chance they could be wrong, they're wrong about 20 to 30% of the time. So as an arbitrary rule, in fact, I, I often encourage people to just take, you know, assign a numerical probability and then lower it by 20% <laughs> because you're almost certainly overconfident. Now, overconfidence, what is that an example of? It's an example of a psychological bias. And that's what's really important here. There's, a, of course, if you remember your Psych 101, there's a whole array of psychological biases impinging upon this question. We really need to be informed of these psychological biases. But more than that, it's not enough to know about psychological biases and how they can skew our thinking. We have to think about our thinking. We have to implement that knowledge. We have to say, OK, I believe this is true. Now why do I believe it? Right? Where did that belief come from? Does it stand up to rational scrutiny? If I scrutinize this belief as harshly as I scrutinize the beliefs of other people, would it still stand up? And that, if I may, should be the foundation of any exercise uh, in which we try to peer into the future. Thanks. Well, Dan, thanks for your leadership on standing up. It's an advantage of being on a panel. Uh, J'aimerais uh, faire cette uh, présentation en français, mais rapidement les francophones ici me demanderaient de la donner en anglais. <laughs> so I'll stick to English if that's okay. Uh, by the way, those of you who are tweeting I'm, and watching on the internet, I'm at D. Tapscott. The future. Uh, for some reason, I've ended up speaking at the same conference a few times recently with Paul Krugman, you know, New York Times columnist, Nobel Prize winning economist. And he says about the future, when you have the meltdown of a financial services industry, you move into a period of prolonged slump. In Japan, they have one in 1992. They're still in a slump. So he says, get ready for a couple of decades of ugliness in the global economy, and that's the good news scenario. Because some bad things can happen, like one of these big countries, Spain, defaults on its sovereign debt, Angela Merkel doesn't step in, the euro collapses, Europe goes into a depression, the global economy goes into a depression. 
Well, far be it from me to debate a Nobel Prize winning economist, but I do have a slightly different view. I think that the future, and I agree with Dan, is not something to be predicted. It's something to be achieved. And we can achieve a very different future than the one that Krugman outlines in the world and in Canada. But to do that, we need to know what the problem is. And the problem in the world, and, and Canada's doing not too bad, but you know, no country can succeed in a world that's failing, and the world is broken. The problem doesn't fall within the paradigm or the mental model of economists who worry about things like the business cycle, and should we have more austerity or, or uh, fi uh, stimulation or whatever. This is not a cyclical change that's underway in Canada or around the world. This is not a business cycle. This is a secular change. I'm convinced that we're at a turning point in human history. That if you look around in Canada, many of the institutions that have served us well for decades or longer are in various stages of being stalled or frozen or in atrophy or even failing. Contrasted with the contours of a sparkling new initiative that shows how we can rebuild this institution, the industrial age is finally run out of gas. And in macroeconomics, um, the best way to get that book is in massive volume, by the way, so should you. <laughs> Christmas is coming soon. Actually, the new version of the book comes out today, so the timing is, is uh, very nice. Uh, we talk about 16 institutions, so I don't have time to go through them all, but let me just kind of stimulate you a bit. The old model of the corporation, the industrial age corporation, typified by General Motors, America's greatest company, it went bankrupt. The internet is radically dropping transaction and collaboration costs and that's leading to a profound change in the deep structure and architecture of the corporation and how we orchestrate capability in society to innovate, to create goods and services. The corporation is becoming unrecognizable from what it was years ago. The financial services industry, I had the awkward pleasure of giving the opening talk about a month ago to something called Ted Wall Street. It was at the New York Stock Exchange and I began, Wall Street, we have a problem. The problem is the core modus operandi of Wall Street almost brought down global capitalism and it hasn't changed a bit. Media, well, the newspaper is going away. 70 newspapers have gone bankrupt in the United States and uh, it's being replaced by some new interesting models of how we inform ourselves as society. Now this is not easy, <laughs> lots of tough issues. How do we ensure good journalism, investigative reporting? How do we pay journalists? How do we ensure that with the balkanization of media that we, we're not all a bunch of, uh, uh, in a bunch of self-reinforcing echo chambers where we only listen to our own point of view. Maybe the purpose of information is not to inform us, but it's to give us comfort. The university and our models of education, I think we have the best model of learning that 17th century technology can provide. <laughs> All of these are industrial age models where you have something at the top or in the middle that controls whatever and it pushes it out. In a standardized way, the industrial age was about standardization and scale and mass production. And the recipients are passive, they're inert. Whether it's mass production or mass media, whether you're pushing out newspapers or radio shows or lectures, none of you are teachers. You know, I'm a teacher, I have knowledge. You're a student, you're an empty vessel, you don't. Get ready, here it comes. It's a one-way, one-size-fits-all model. It's focused on the teacher. The student is a passive recipient. So how do we move towards a new model of student-focused, custom-based learning? That's not me, is it? No. Um, where students get to collaborate in the learning process. Well, we know how to do this. It's not about, about predicting the future. It's about what works. There are new models of pedagogy that are far superior. Our models of government, we have these industrial age bureaucracies that rose up at the same time as the industrial age corporation. Bureaucracy was a hot management term 90 years ago. And we needed it to, to, have, uh, to prevent patronage and graft and corruption and control, you know, take care of the public uh, uh, investment and so on. Well now these huge 
bureaucratic monoliths are giving way to new models of open government where government can be a platform. This is not about e-gov or something like that. This is about governments giving away raw data and creating a platform whereby other governments, private companies, civil society organizations, and individual citizens can self-organize to create public value. This is a change in the division of labor in society about how we create public value or services as we call them. Democracy, you know, I vote, you rule. Uh, this is a industrial age model and I'm not proposing direct democracy, Ross Pro in the electronic town hall, you get to vote every night on the evening news, that's a bad idea. AK the electronic mob, democracy is a lot more than majority rule on a nightly basis. One of the things it's about is protecting the rights of minorities. But the first era of democracy created these representative institutions, but there was a weak public mandate and inert citizenry. Couldn't we create a new model based on a, a culture of public deliberation and active citizenship? This is not something that, that I'm predicting around the world. This is beginning to happen through digital brainstorms, challenges, governments reaching out and engaging people. Science. Pharmaceutical companies are about to fall off something called the patent cliff, where they're going to use, in Canada and around the world, they're going to lose 25 to 35 percent of their revenue in the next year. What do you do? Your company, you lose a third of your revenue in a year. Cut back on office costs? No. We need to change the model of science. Pharmaceutical companies need to embrace the commons. They need to use the internet to place pre-competitive research called proof of clinical mechanism in a commons. They need to start sharing clinical trial data so that a rising tide lifts all boats. Healthcare. We have an industrial age model. I'm a physician, <laughs> I'm a clinician, I have knowledge. You're a patient, you don't. Get ready, I deliver healthcare to you. And you only get it when you come into the system and please don't collaborate with anyone else because they don't know anything and you're gonna confuse yourself and stay away from the internet. <laughs> well, 20% of all people in North America that have Lou Gehrig's disease are on a collaborative platform called Patients Like Me and it is improving healthcare by moving healthcare to a collaborative model. So, and, and, and medical researchers love this. They learn so much about the collaboration that's happening, what works, drug interactions, different kinds of treatments and procedures to help manage the disease. My modest little proposal on healthcare if I could ever get the minis uh, ministers of health to listen or the federal government Every Canadian baby should get a website. And all of you should too. And it's half electronic health care record, half social network for health. And uh, clinicians provide most of the data, but you've got a social network and you've got Lou Gehrig's disease, you go into a community, or you've got anything else, you, you have diabetes, you, you're trying to manage obesity, you go into a community. You know, we're not going to fix obesity by lecturing people. Isolation is the number one um, risk factor in health. We need to engage people in collaborative communities. And in doing so, we can dramatically reduce the cost of health care and dramatically improve the quality. But we're involved in these old industrial age debates. Which province should get more money for health care? No, we need to fix the whole paradigm. I'll just mention one other, which is our institutions for global problem solving. These came out of the Second World War. Bretton Woods created the World Bank and the, <laughs> the United Nations, the IMF and the GATT and the you know, G20 and the G8 and, and whatever. They can't seem to solve global problems. So are these problems just too hard to solve or do we have an old model that's based on nation states? Now the nation state's not going to go away in my lifetime but Nation states are too big for the little problems and they're too small for the big problems. They're the wrong size for a global economy. On the other hand, you look around the world, there are tens of millions of people involved in a new model of global problem solving called multi-stakeholder networks. And these things are extraordinary and they're becoming material. There are multi-issue 
networks like, uh, th that attempt to convene important people like the Clinton Global Initiative or the World Economic Forum or the Global Water Resources Council. There are single issue networks. Coney, 2012. I mean, who saw that video in the room? Not everybody. Okay, well, if you remember one thing, K-O-N-Y 2012. It's a half hour video, go watch it. I saw it, it was a couple months ago now, on a Monday night, 12,000 people had seen it. On Friday, 100 million people had seen this video. And it's this global, multi-stakeholder network called Invisible Children trying to uh, make the African warlord, Joseph Kony, famous. You know, you know this guy, right? He kidnaps children, 60,000 kids. The girls are sex slaves. The boys become soldiers. If, if they don't cooperate, he kills their families. The, the boys are not good soldiers. He cuts off their faces. He's a bad guy. So this network, all of a sudden, is material in the world. The US Congress is taking action. Coney's going to get caught as a result. But on the other hand, there's a lot about these things that we don't know. It's like, what's the new model of informing ourselves as a society? I mean, who's this thing accountable to? It's inspired, but is, is it legitimate? Where does the money go? Who gets to determine the policy of this thing? You know, is it right that we should have more US troops in, in Africa? What happens when your leader has a meltdown, as the leader of Invisible Children did? So this is a time of, of great peril and danger. But to me, it's fundamentally a time of vast new opportunity. But if we're going to invent a new future rather than trying to predict it, we need to all get engaged. And fortunately, we have a new platform, the internet, uh, to do that. So uh, when I think about the future, um, I'm more optimistic than I've ever been, notwithstanding all the huge challenges that we have in the world today. Because I look around everywhere, and in every one of these institutions, People are taking action to rebuild them around a new set of principles and around the communications medium of our time. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm going to buck the trend by sitting down. Um, and also by giving away my publication as opposed to selling it. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll pay you to buy mine. <laughs> yeah, beat that. <laughs> um, so we do have copies in French and English um, out there. That's my, my tribute to French. Um, but uh, I do want to pick up on, on what's been said already. I think we, uh, to uh, Canada 2020, we. Uh, we think about the future a lot, and we do think that it is a future to be achieved. It's not something that we can sit back and wait to happen to us. Uh, and in that context, we, uh, we do focus on the role of the federal government. We do believe that the federal government matters and can be a force for good. Um, some people might dispute that, but um, uh, not necessarily in a traditional way, the sort of nanny state thinking about the federal government, but in a sort of strategic way uh, of thinking where we want to be. You know, we want a economically dynamic, socially inclusive, internationally relevant Canada, and how are we going to get there? Um, uh, and and that's, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and I would say that uh, also, what uh, Dan just said, I'm getting my Dons and my Dans um, mixed up, but uh, uh, no, what Don just said was um, that, that we want to participate more in the debate, we want it as more kind of crowdsourcing and getting involved, and that's what we're trying to do. The, I would say that the level of debate about federal policy in this country is uh, not strong, uh, it's not necessarily encouraged. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do is, is broaden the debate, have an influence on policy and the development of policy, and to include everyone. That's you, that's, that's people through the internet, etc. cetera. Um, so we started our, uh, uh, we've been around for a while, but we started the, the particular project that I'm gonna talk about today about a year ago. We invited uh, a bunch of distinguished people uh, to contribute their views. Uh, of where we want to be and how we're going to get there again with the, with the focus on the federal government role. Not ex I mean, we're not, I, I should clarify that we're not 
saying that it's only federal government, but we're playing, saying that the federal government is a very important partner uh, in getting us to uh, where we want to be. Uh, so we invited people from business. We have the global head of McKinsey. We have the president of Shell Canada. We have people from the public sector. We have ex-provincial cabinet ministers, uh, the former clerk. We have academics. We have other people uh, who've contributed to the publication that, that you have, I hope, there. This is a starting point in the debate. This is kind of the opening salvo in trying to get to grips with some of these issues. Um, and we identified five key areas that we think are very important to, to the future and creating that Canada that we wish to see. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a little sense of, I'll tell you what those areas are and give you a sense of the kind of things we're talking about in those areas. Um, but uh, we can come back, obviously we don't have that much time here. Uh, so we have been thinking about uh, income inequality. We've been thinking about productivity and innovation, and these also link with the, uh, the share priorities. Uh, we've been thinking about Asia and the influence uh, or the, the impact of Asia on our lives and how we can take advantage of the new opportunities there and meet the challenges. Uh, carbon and energy, obviously, and health. It always, health is always on the list. And these are all interlinked, and they're not the whole story. It's not that you know, this is the only thing the government does, but we think that these are areas where strategic thought is necessary. We shouldn't get caught up in the, you know, what's happening tomorrow and, and focus on that. We should be proactive. There's obviously been enormous shifts in, in global power recently, and we think that uh, that makes it even more critical not to be reactive but proactive about the future. Um, so briefly, uh, income inequality rapidly rising up the agenda. In the, in the year since we started work, it was, it was uh, not that visible. It's now, by some polls, the top uh, issue in this country. Certainly, it's, it's become an issue in the American election in a way that it never was before. I think people have said that this is the first American election where being rich was actually kind of a bad thing. Um, so. Uh, it's increasing everywhere uh, in middle income countries as well as developed countries such as this. Um, many causes, I'm sure you're familiar, you probably, there's probably people here who work in the area, but uh, technological change, uh, globalization, deregulation, flattening tax structures all play, play a role. Um, and it matters, it matters to societal welfare, regardless of how well I'm doing, absolutely. My, you know, I'll be less happy if you're doing better than me. I mean, that's been shown time and time again. And it matters because it's a political issue and it is bubbling up and we've seen that time again now. Uh, Canada is in the middle of the pack on, or in the middle of the OECD pack on income inequality. Um, but we're at the very top in terms of the accumulation of wealth in the top 1%. So we're number three behind the US and the UK uh, in terms of how much the people at the very top have. And our income inequality is rising more rapidly than in some of the countries that we typically think of as being more unequal than us. Uh, on the plus side, we are still a much more united society. I think you know, the, the wealthy people in this country, they live in nice neighborhoods. They don't live in gated communities yet. They do share the same institutions with the rest of us. The kids, you know, many of them do go to the public schools. They, they pass through the same health system on their way to, uh, on their way to the U.S. No, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I think that's that's where we are, you know, focusing. I mean, if we think about equality of opportunity, and obviously you can address inequality uh, by by through the tax system, but that's difficult at the moment, and also. Uh, there's a lot of debate around the efficacy of higher income taxes. And you know, the UK just dropped their top rate of income tax um, in the recent budget. And obviously, there's been a lot of noise in Ontario about the, the, whether or not it's a good idea to, to raise income taxes. But I think our focus is more on equality of opportunity, building up those institutions that bind us together, um, and making sure that people have a good start in life, that health and education are, uh, are effective and working for people, and bring people into the system so that the contribute economically um, and, uh, and I, I should say that you know one of the one of the issues is is jobs I mean it, this is all about wage disparities that's what's happened is that some jobs pay less well than others and increasingly that's 
uh, that's the case. And so we have to focus on creating, the, there's, a, there's a, a dichotomy now between what they call lovely jobs and lousy jobs. Uh, and a sense that the middle is falling out and, and Canada has to focus on making sure that there are some lovely jobs out there for us all to do. Uh, which links into the second area we're looking at, which is innovation and productivity, which I'm not going to say too much about. It's that there's somewhat less of a government role there. I mean, in the end, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a broad effort that has to achieve success there. And I think I'll leave that. Um, uh, Don is, I'm sure, an expert in innovation, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave that one to him. Uh, but our, our performance um, in that regard has a bearing on what we do in Asia. Um, and in the last week or so, we've heard a bunch about how Asian growth rates are slowing, but they're still going to be above 8% uh, this year. And we, we still, you know, the emerging markets have accounted for two thirds of the growth uh, that's occurred since the, I would say since the uh, financial crisis ended, but since it hasn't ended, you know, since the peak of the financial crisis subsided, let's put it that way. Um, so Asia is clearly there. Uh, we are not doing that well in Asia. Uh, generally, our exports have not been, our export growth has been dismal. Um, we don't export that much to Asia. Uh, and despite our long people-to-people -people ties, we really haven't done well that way. Um, it's a huge opportunity, goes without saying. They, in China and India, Every year, 70 million people are added to the middle class. Every year, they have to house the equivalent of the population of Canada. And this is, as we know, a massive opportunity. And we need to be top of mind in Asia. And I think our thought is that we need to go beyond energy exports. Uh, we're, I, I think we can anticipate that the next few years are going to be, there's going to be a lot of talk about energy exports to Asia and the pros and cons of that. Clearly important. And even if we do open doors in that way, we have to be prepared to follow that up to get the best out of our energy exports if that's the way we're going. You know, it's not a question of kind of opening the pipeline and sitting back. And um, so we have to, and I think this is an area which we have to be innovative uh, and the federal government has to curate a wide range of relationships. Yes, they have started again in the year since we started our work. They've, uh, the federal government has moved forward with a sort of unprecedented push towards uh, trade agreements with Asian countries. Um, but it's, again, we feel that it's about more than that. It's about people-to-people -people exchanges. It's about education. It's about a really exciting, dynamic cultural exchange. These countries are, you know, they're economically important. They're culturally becoming more important. They're politically becoming more important in, in, the, in the sense that we have to develop a kind of web, a network between our countries um, that is deep profound will last, they will stay the distance and will enable us to really uh, leapfrog others because we are coming from behind in Asia, it has to be said. I mean, the small countries like the Netherlands and places like that have a wider recognition factor in, in Asia than, than Canada does, except for, for you know, mountains and fresh air. Um, and we have to counter the, the negative feelings in Canada about Asia. So the Asia Pacific Foundation uh, of Canada they do an annual poll on attitudes towards Asia. Uh, this year, it came out that 55% of people felt that the top priority for this country, the top foreign policy priority, was to uh, strengthen economic and political ties with Asia. However, when they asked people about how they felt about Asian countries, when it comes to China, for example, only 12% of people reported having warm feelings about China. So we still see Asia as a threat, I think, is the point of view. And we need to turn it into an opportunity for the country. Um, carbon, if, if there's been progress or change in income inequality issues, uh, Asia, carbon, I think the, in the last year, it's either no progress or going backwards. Um, we've uh, seen how little we've achieved relative to our notional targets that we uh, continue to pay lip service to, but in terms of you know, carbon reductions, we've had tiny reductions, but they really it, it amounts to very little. Um, and uh, I don't know if you follow, but for example, the Transalta had a big carbon capture storage project uh, in Alberta that was recently canceled because they, the, the economic incentives weren't there for them. So that was going to be a million tons of carbon taken out of the atmosphere when that came on stream, but that was pulled. So the, and, and of course, we're staking our future on increased resource extraction. Um, so 
I don't think I, th this is an audience that I have to talk about the importance of, of getting to grips with the carbon problem. Um, I mean, it's, it's all the hazards of climate change, which we will face, and all the uncertainty and the risk there. Um, but we're also not positioning ourselves for the future economy, assuming that we can get over this. We can, uh, through the power of, of people with governments assisting, whatever it might be, that, that we do move into a sort of post-carbon economy to some extent. I don't think Canada is presently going to be uh, well-placed for that. Um, and I talked about a Canada that is internationally relevant. And I think being a, an international pariah was not exactly what I had in mind um, <laughs> thinking of that. So um, I think that you know there are opportunities, I know, in, in uh, Don's book, he talks about sort of crowdsource uh, type approaches to, to reducing carbon and how we can all get together and do that. Um, again, we do feel that getting the incentives right is important. We, you know, working on the, the things that obviously other people are working on, so market-based solutions, um, but also thinking about how you can build up from what the provinces are doing on carbon. They are doing a lot more uh, than the federal government and how that's the second best solution, but how we can work um, up from that point of view, point and, and, and kind of create the economic incentives to make, to make, to make progress there. Uh, health is our fifth area. Again, a much change in the last year. The federal government has uh, stepped back from playing a role in health. In a way, that's positive. They put money on the table, and, and I think that has pushed the provinces to stop uh, blaming them and actually have to get to grips with the problem. I think there's much more profound changes that need to be, take place, as, as, as has been mentioned, in the health system uh, than, than is talked about today. And we see it's, a, it's an area that, in fact, there is a good deal of experimentation. What we don't seem to be very good about is, is implementation and learning from each other in health and learning from other countries and really kind of shaking up the system. Um, so that's where we're at. We're, it's, we're in the beginning stages, work in progress. We really do want participation in this. And we are, one of our real objectives is to increase the debate about these types of issues. There's a lot of questioning these days more generally about the role of the state and you know whether many of the problems we face are amenable to policy solutions. Um, we believe that they are to some extent. Uh, we believe that, that it's all about the new constellations of actors who are coming to, coming to play a part, but uh, that the federal government can do, it is unique in the role that it can play and the leadership that it can if it wishes to uh, uh, the, the leadership role it can um, play in the future, um, and that that will be a key determinant of where we are in 2020, 2030, and beyond. Thank you. J'aimerais remercier nos trois présentateurs pour leurs propos très percutants. Uh, and I would like to invite uh, the three of them maybe to engage with each other for a few minutes. Um, I mean, we heard a range of, of opinions. There's, on the one hand, sorry, on the one hand, Dan, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Uh, it's always important to have that historical perspective. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Dawn, uh, we have human beings from the Stone Age, our institutions are medieval, and we have godlike technology, so that's an interesting conundrum to think about. And then uh, Diana, to, to get down to brass tacks, the environment is changing and we have to get on with it and, uh, and, and get ourselves together in terms of, of where, how we position ourselves uh, you know, for, for a number of, of contingencies that, that, that may emerge. And so I, I found those three presentations very complimentary and very helpful uh, in general to our work. And I just want to mention also the role of the research community is key in all of this. I think we at Shirk strongly believe that the social sciences and humanities research community is essential to the future of this country and the role it plays in research and research training. And our sister agencies, CIHR and NSARC, are also collaborating uh, and supporting us on this initiative. Alors, euh, j'invite pour quelques minutes nos présentateurs d'échanger de, des idées while our president uh, uh, sums up and, and has a, a, an opportunity to, to give his own uh, take on this conversation and then we'll invite uh, the people in the audience to, to feed in. So, please go ahead. May I suggest a connecting theme? It's uncertainty and the subversion of uncertainty, which is my, my obsession, which is probably why I'm seeing it there. Uh, 
Last week I was speaking with uh, Vino Kosla, who's a, a legendary Silicon Valley venture capitalist. And Kosla is very big on the unpredictability of the future. And you might say, well, how can you be big on the unpredictability of, about the future if you're constantly betting on new technologies and, and apparently successfully because he's made an enormous amount of money? Um, it's because he looks at what he does as an experiment. He thinks maybe this will work. And so he puts money into it. But it's an experiment. He's not certain of the outcome. He's trying many experiments. And that is how rational people approach these problems. The biggest problem I find with the political class, uh, and that includes the media, is we have this aversion to experimentation. Because at the root of experimentation is an acknowledgment of uncertainty. You don't do an experiment if you already know the answer. You have to acknowledge that you don't know the answer. That's when you will engage in experimentation. The problem with our politics is precisely the politicians cannot stand up and say, I don't know what the answer is, but let's experiment and try and find out. Because they will be punished at the polls by people who want to hear certainty. And uh, you know, I don't know how to square this circle. I mean, it's very, it, it, it's awful. In the last provincial election, we saw one of the one of the parties, one of their main attack lines was risky experimentation. Risky experiments. Experiment is a bad word in politics. It's an absolutely perverse state. But I think that gets to the crux of it. We have to experiment with new models, as Don <coughs> was talking about. With the, the challenges that Diana was talking about, we have to experiment. We have to start small. Start at a level where you can afford to fail. This is all common sense, but getting it into the political sphere is tough. I think, to me, what's happening is that we do have a whole new set of models for all of these institutions which are beginning to emerge. And uh, <clears throat> this is a new paradigm. And I'm allowed to use that word, OK, because I wrote the book Paradigm Shift 20 <laughs> years ago. Um, although, of course, the notion of a paradigm was not me. It was Thomas Kuhn, the structure of scientific re revolutions in the 60s. But when you get one of these, um, you get uh, dislocation, conflict, uncertainty, risk. Um, new paradigms are nearly always received with coolness, or worse, mockery, hostility. Uh, vested interests fight against change, and leaders of old paradigms have the greatest difficulty embracing the new. You look around at, I, I've mentioned half a dozen or so institutions, the leaders of those institutions are the ones that are resisting change. Or, you know, with, with some exceptions, but overall, uh, that's true. So, um, to, to me, the, the issue of leadership is a huge question on how we move forward. And I'd, I'd love to get into that a bit. But I just wanted to pick up something you said, <laughs> which is all about a medieval. I want to make a, 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 not how many angels can dance on the head of a pin here, but I do want to make an important uh, clarification. Because to me, our institutions are, are not medieval. Um, we had medieval institutions. Dur you know, all around the world, we had an agrarian economy and the means of production and political system was called feudalism. And uh, knowledge was concentrated in tiny handfuls, the church and, and the, uh, the nobility, the medieval nobility. And uh, there was no concept pr uh, of progress. You were just kind of born, you lived your life, and you died. But nothing ever really moved forward. And along comes Johannes Gutenberg with this great invention, the printing press. And over time, different uh, parts of the society started to get knowledge. And when they did, the institutions of agrarian feudal society appeared to be uh, stalled, or frozen, or an atrophy, or even failing. It didn't make sense for the, the, the Catholic Church to be responsible for medicine when people had knowledge. It didn't make sense for a bunch of kings and nobles to be running everything. Um, so Martin Luther called uh, the printing press God's highest act of grace. Uh, we saw the rise of parliamentary democracy, science, the university, the corporation, and, and the nation state and eventually the Industrial Revolution and the Industrial Age, and it was all good. It advanced our standard of living and had all kinds of great new institutions emerge. Um, but it came with a cost. Um, carbon being a really big one. I mean, we all talk about how beautiful it is out today, and uh, global warming is just going to be great for Canada. and, and uh, you know, in the short term, that might be due if it weren't for the fact that a billion and a half people are going to lose half of their water supply in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, uh, not according to uh, 
futurists, according to scientists who've got sophisticated models for determining what's going on. So, um, meanwhile, to, to get to the point, um, once again, to me what's happening today is the technology genius once again out of the bottle. Only this time it's very different. The printing press gave us access to the written word. The internet enables each of us to be a publisher. The printing press gave us access to recorded information and knowledge. The internet gives us access to the knowledge contained in the crania of other people on a global basis. This is not an information age that we're into. Now, it's an age of, of networking of human intelligence. It's an age of collaboration. And when you think like that, you can start to see the contours of what a new healthcare system could look like, what a new uh, media could look like, on how television, broadcasting, well, it's, it's getting to the point where it's no longer broad and it's no longer casting. You know, TV is becoming a cool app on the internet. Um, so all of these new institutions can now be rebuilt. Don't predict how, make it happen. And, and determine what are the principles to rebuild these things. And to me, these are principles of collaboration, of openness, of sharing of intellectual property, of interdependence, and, and of integrity. And we can now rebuild these institutions if we can find the leadership to do it. And that's the challenge facing Canada, in my mind. I'm sorry, that was like 90,000 feet. I will now participate in the actual conversation. <laughs> Diana? It's, it's, um, it's interesting what you said about um, the risky experiment, the sort of dirty word of ri risky experimentation. Um, and it, you know, undoubtedly in the public sphere, it is difficult. I mean, the, 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 constant, you know, the cost of a bad change is, is quite high and people are very risk averse. We also don't have the right, probably the right um, personal incentives to, to try and sort of push change through. But there is a sense somehow that you know, if you can rebrand risky experimentation as innovation and a kind of uh, a, a new future. But I think that that takes, you know, that takes a really huge effort um, to, to, to talk about the future in a, in a way, I mean, there's a balance here, right? We're not predicting the future, but to talk about the future as something that we can um, aspire to great things in and that we can influence uh, and I fear that at the moment we tend to I mean the carbon debate is obviously the, the, the key one but we're you know we're kind of deer caught in the headlights um, about carbon we know but we don't know and we uh, and we stop there but just in general that we're not really encouraged to think of the future as something that that is uh, that we can manipulate um, uh, or we can come together to create. And, and something that we can innovate to get to a better future, and that's, that's what concerns me. Could I just pick up the issue of policy? Because I think that's a, a kind of central one here. Um, what kind of risky experimentation could we do in policy? I was just talking to a guy yesterday. I just learned about this yesterday. His name is Dr. Stan Kucher. He's one of the, uh, lives in um, the East Coast, Halifax, I think. He's one of the world's leading psychiatrists in adolescent mental health. And he was involved in the, the spectacular Mental Health condition, uh, Commission that just three weeks ago came up with this wonderful report. And there's a sea change happening on this topic, around the, the stigma on mental illness, that it's not just a, a failing of human character, it's more a failing of brain biochemistry. And uh, in the, he was in the, or chairing, I guess, the Youth Commission part of this, thinking about young people. And rather than doing the traditional approach where you hold a bunch of hearings and then you have uh, two smart people write a report and then they push the report out and try and sell the report and so on, he decided to develop the policy in a completely new way. So they created a wiki and they engaged dozens of people in co-authoring, key people in co-authoring this report. And then they gave full access to all of the drafts and the documents to thousands of other people who couldn't make changes. So it wasn't like Wikipedia, it wasn't a full wiki. But they could comment on anything in the report. And then all of this stuff got synthesized and eventually a small group of about 30 people pulled it together and created uh, a document. Now um, they want to publish it and create a community to 
uh, to sort of dis discuss this thing. It's just a very different approach. You know, Glenn Murray uh, was the Minister of Innovation in Ontario. He wanted to create a policy around social innovation for Ontario. And rather than the usual way of having a bunch of smart people create a policy and consult and so on, they created a wiki. And they had hundreds of people that were involved in creating this document. The final chapter of Wikinomics was a wiki written by 1,500 people. And it just kind of happened. So, um, you know, in the extreme example of this, I suppose, would be Wikipedia. Here's an encyclopedia, 20 times bigger than Britannica. It's in 210 languages. And according to the big study that's been done, the quality is just as good. So couldn't we, the, the, this question of how policy gets created, to me, is just a, a single instance in how we could fundamentally change the whole way that governments operate and engage uh, uh, with, with their citizens. But it's risky experimentation, I guess. You know, it's like, well, what happens if all kinds of weird people come in and create a whole weird policy? And, uh, you know, we fear. We, we fear what we don't understand. And we don't need to, because if you curate these things properly, you always get something that's spectacularly better than the way you did it in the old model. Thank you very much. That's the Wikipedia reference is an interesting gender dimension because I, I heard it said that it's 25-year-old men who mostly contribute to those kinds of so it kind of begs the question of what are the voices that are that are not present. But I, I, th I thought that was uh, very useful. Just before opening up for well, questions, well, I would just if I could. <laughs> uh, to Dan's point. To Dan's point. So what do we do? We say, well, the future is that these things really suck because you end up with lack of. Uh, 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 gender equality, or do you say, this is an opportunity to create a new future and women ought to get more yeah. involved in writing Wikipedia. Right. I mean, it's yeah. just, what is your perspective on the future? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, just to get you warmed up before inviting uh, Dr. Chad Gaffield to, to sum up a bit before the question period, I uh, just want to put a flea in everyone's ear, uh, maybe when you start thinking of your questions and comments. Um, you know, what are those black swans and weak signals that we might see? If you look back 5, 10, 20 years, I mean, I think of myself, I didn't use the word app five years ago. I, mean, I don't think I, I knew what it was. Um, 20 years ago, I'm not even that old, but I, I got my first glimpse uh, of the World Wide Web. You know, I mean, uh, I was well into adulthood. And so what are those new, I'm, I'm wondering, what do, we, what do we not know? I mean, what are these, these, some of these new technologies that are just starting to hit the streets and are we ready uh, for, for the kind of impacts that, that might come forward? Um, Maintenant, j'aimerais inviter notre président, M. Chad Garfield, qui a le don de, de faire des résumés des, des discussions complexes pour lancer la période des questions et des commentaires. Je vous remercie et bonjour à tous et toutes, vous dans la salle et uh, vous qui sont branchés uh, ce matin. C'est juste un thrill. Je veux dire how much I've enjoyed these presentations. Uh, I'm an historian, and you think about, um, well, you know, historians study the past, but most of us actually are deeply interested in the future, and think about what we really are, are interested in, it's change. And I think our speakers today really are emphasizing that, that, that what we're, our topic really is, is this question of, of change. And I know in my own case, when I was, you know, how do I study the future, I thought, well, I really want to think about that in terms of change and I spent my career re really studying that, the creation uh, of that um, agricultural to industrial model and how did that happen and I think I would agree with with Don that today we're living a Kuhnian paradigm shift moving from an industrial model to something else and I think it's it, it's pertinent. One of the uh, themes that was really emphasized uh, I think this morning is that uh, all of us do think about the future, and we can either think about it explicitly or implicitly, but we all function our daily lives about the future, and the, and the question becomes, how do we move from uh, a kind of a certainty model and so on, but to think about change in ways that really embraces the, the, the multiple futures and the multiple possible futures and so on, whether it's that as us as citizens, as consumers, as uh, government leaders, as, as uh, running businesses, whatever it is, how do we really think about the future in ways that, that's helpful. The other theme of this is, that I think is so important, is and it really embraces the notion that we make the future. Uh, and I think for a long time there has been that sense of inevitability and, and 
viewing ourselves a little bit as as really having to adapt to a future simply rather than the notion of of creating a future and making the uh, perhaps the one we want and and that's why Giselle and the team are leading an initiative imagining Canada's future that really has in it the notion that it's in our hands and it's human decisions that are making uh, this future obviously this notion of the an unintended and intended consequences of all those human decisions that we take now is, I think, is really at the heart of this. I want to focus my my comment, though, and, and maybe uh, stimulate some discussion around what I think is a real tension that's gone throughout the the three presentations, and that is between you know the human and the non-human environment, technology. How, how how does that work? What's driving what? I think I've heard a lot, and we still hear this notion of a technologically driven society. How, for example, the digital age is changing us. Um, and my sense is that, um, and, and again, you know, and where is that, where is that going? One of the themes, and, and Dan was really good, I think, in emphasizing one aspect of that, is that is the extent to which we tend to overestimate how technology is really changing and then going to change us. Uh, his example made me think of Expo 67 and the idea that we were all going to have those little jet packs on our back and we were going to be able to individually kind of, kind of zoom around and, and so on. So on the one hand, I think there is a continued overestimation of, of technological change. But on the other side, what I'm struck by, and the, and the digital age really emphasizes this a lot as well, is underestimation. So for example, computerization, the, the origins of computerization really from the late 19th century on, continually underestimated, which I find really interesting. So in other words, you know, and, and what's the use of a computer? At the early stage, it was, to, it was administrative. The first big use was the census. The, uh, taking the, the governments in the, in the US and then in Canada, taking the census, using, uh, you know, use computerization, the Hollywood cards and so on, but it was gonna have very limited uses. And then it goes on in terms of you know, some military uses during, during the wars and so on. But again, you know, Watson and IBM predicting they're gonna use five, the world is gonna need five mainframes after the Second World War, right, he predicts very limited use and so on. And you can walk through the last decades in terms of every time a digital Sorry. technology comes out underestimated in terms of, of, of where it's going. So what's up with that? And I want to say that there are two things, and this links to, I think, a, a number of our, our uh, presentations. The first one, I would argue that we built an industrial world that was based on assumptions about human beings that we now know are simply wrong. And my idea is that it's only in the last few decades that we've taken seriously the challenge of understanding human beings, human thought and behavior. And, and now that we have start, started actually focusing and trying to understand human beings, it turns out that many of the assumptions that we uh, built on, built a whole industrial model on for a couple of centuries, haven't worked out. One, a quick one is obviously schooling. And it's kind of humbling to think about that. We spent a few centuries building school systems that it now are pretty clear fly in the face of how people learn. I mean, it's kind of a little depressing to think about that, right? As you know, we now know that the model, the industrial model through the 19th and much of the 20th century, and still used in many, many cases, flies in the face of how people learn. So, I would argue that in the 20th century, we got real serious about trying to understand how, how molecules collide and predicting the weather and so on, and now we're finally really starting to dive in and learn how people think, why we behave, the decisions we make, and so on. And I know in the discipline of history, for example, Really, until the 1960s, most of us, we could name the number of historians who really seriously focused on trying to understand historical change. So modest. So now we're taking this serious. We're trying to take seriously the challenge of understanding human beings. And I would argue that as a result of that, three or many deep conceptual changes are now underpinning our efforts to make a new paradigm and to embrace the digital age in ways that, that really fit with human beings and, and explain, I think, some of these themes. And I want to ask our panel to say, 
Are we right in thinking that changed understandings and better knowledge about human beings is what's really driving and explains why the digital age has become so important, why crowdsourcing and all the issues that were emphasized, this, the very different ideas have come to be. My three favorite conceptual changes, redefining how we think about creativity. The industrial age said basically that a very, very small number of creative people, the experts, were gonna tell everyone else basically how things could go and we were going to apply it. And that was the whole point of school system. We went in to learn what this little teeny weeny tiny group of experts and the rest of us were going to apply it. So that's really interesting. Now we have a very, very different view of human creativity and I think it explains crowdsourcing, all sorts of things like that. It's pr pretty interesting, but it also has big implications for the expert uh, and, and how we organize society on and on. Second thing, uh, a really different view of diversity, which I think is interesting. We spent uh, a couple of centuries in the industrial model thinking that there was some best way to do everything, and if the whole world did it, all acted like that, then it, it would be good. Now we know, uh, mention of the environment and so on, that in fact, diversity is really at the heart of resilience of all sorts of good things. And if we go down the path of homogenation, uh, uh, best and so on, it's gonna lead us to very, very bad things as, as we've experienced. Third, deep conceptual change, complexity. We functioned for a long time, a number of centuries, believing that whatever seemed to be complex, underneath it were simple things, and if we just got to that simplicity, we could add it all up and, and understand the whole thing. We've done it on campuses, for example, and the fragmentation of knowledge, all sorts of things, specialization, and then we get added up. And now we know it's not additive. It's dynamic, it's nonlinear, on and on. Change is complex, deeply complex. So, I guess my point is, is, are, is, it, is it these two things? That, that is to say, taking seriously the challenge of understanding human beings and now realizing that we have organized a society, a world that flies in the face of people. So that's pretty, pretty chilling. And that are there deep conceptual changes now that we've got to come to grips with and say we have to do more in terms of, and Don, you had one example of this, in terms of the need for continued understandings, whether it's of mental health or, or on and on, if we are really gonna create in the 21st century a successful society that begins to realize the potential of, of, of human beings. So, voila. Merci beaucoup. While our audience thinks of its questions and comments, uh, maybe if any reactions from our three panelists mm -hmm. to our president's uh, uh, meta-narrative. May I jump in? Yeah. I think you should. Um, <laughs> your last point, uh, you know, you asked that question, you know, are, we, are we adapting to basically what we are learning? Uh, are we changing our ways? Uh, I'm, both, I'm both pessimistic and optimistic in a sense. You, you mentioned complexity. You know, is, is reality cloud or is it clock? We know that it's cloud. Uh, and as a result of this, many, many things follow. Uh, much must be changed. Don, your work is a pretty good example of that. Um, and if you look at what's happening, how, well, behavioral economics is a good example. How long did it take for us to go from Kahneman and Tversky's foundational work in the 1970s to the point where anybody is even aware of it in the broader population and is prepared to actually talk about it in practical policy terms? 30 years and some would say we're not even there yet. Uh, that's pretty depressing. But then on the other hand, if I ask myself from another perspective, from the historian's perspective for instance, if I stand back a little bit, and I say, well how long does that sort of profound conceptual change take? Probably more than 30 years. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I, d d just on a couple of the issues, do we over or underestimate the impact of technology? I think we, uh, overestimate the speed and we underestimate the impact. Um, I started in 1977 at Bell Northern Research uh, in a group called the Office of the Future trying to figure out how computers connected to this vast network of networks uh, that we call the ARPANET would change the nature of work organizations and society. 
And I thought it was going to happen a lot faster than it did. We had this crazy idea that communication, the computers were a communications tool and that they would be used by regular people, normal people. For 10 years after that, people would say to me, you're wrong. And the reason is, this will never happen. The reason is, managers will never learn to type. <laughs> I became a typing evangelist for a decade. <laughs> so I think I was overestimating the speed, but I absolutely underestimated uh, the impact. You know, Thomas Watson famously uh, predicted that the world will only need five computers, although I can't actually find evidence that he said that. But if he did, originally I thought he was off by the number four because the internet's become a giant computational platform. It's a big computer that we all use. But now I've changed my mind. I think he was right. There are about five computers. There's the Google computer and the Amazon computer and the <laughs> IBM computer and the, these clouds. You know, there are these massive computational uh, platforms. Why is this all, what are the drivers? I think technology is one uh, for sure, but it's not technology about providing information. It's technology that links human intelligence. I think there's a big driver, which is a demographic driver. We have the first generation to come of age in the digital age, and these kids are different. I started studying kids about 15 years ago when I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all this sophisticated technology. At first I thought my children are prodigies. <laughs> and, uh, but then I noticed that all their friends were like them, so that was a bad theory. So um, I started working uh, in the mid-90s with uh, 300 kids. and In 97 I wrote this book called Growing Up Digital. I said these kids have no fear of technology because it's like the air. You know, it's like I have no fear of a refrigerator. Um, but I'm a digital immigrant. I had to learn the language. They're, they're digital natives. And they, they actually think differently, and their brains are different. We just, a couple of years ago, finished a $4 million research project where we interviewed 11,000 young people in 10 countries. They have different brains, and they're better brains. They're more appropriate brains for our age. I'd be happy to defend that. I think that another big driver is that that industrial capitalism is inexorably coming to this global crisis where it's not only uh, stalling um, and its institutions are stalling. I mean, what's going on in Europe is an example of that with the sovereign debt mess. But that it's now creating a burning platform. You know the, the analogy that a burning platform is occurs when where you are, the cost of staying where you are become much greater than the cost of moving to something radically different. And that's why in all of these, we've been talking about reinvention of government for 25 years. We actually have a burning platform. We have to reinvent government. We have to change the entire architecture of government and the relationship between people and their, their governments and so on. And I think the other driver is a big um, social one. And it's not just that there are a billion people on Facebook or 200 million in Facebook causes, or that, that people at their fingertips have this tool to self-organize like never before the Arab Spring, um, you know, Occupy, uh, and so on. But it's that this is beginning to change some very fundamental things about how we are as people, about how we think, about how we interact uh, uh, with other people. And some of this we don't really know. Uh, where, where it's uh, going to be. So you put all that together and you've got the, you know, the, whatever, the analogy works, the perfect storm, the secret sauce, the, the uh, tipping point, the, the sea change that, that is happening to, today in the world. So I don't think it's just technology. I think it's more complicated than that. Stop. Uh, I do have things to say, but I okay. Conscious, conscious people standing up. Now, just for yeah. that, we have 40 minutes for questions. I would ask um, people to please ide identify themselves, introduce themselves, keep their questions short. Uh, and what we'll do is maybe we'll take three, three at a time. So one, two, three. So please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Ariel Court from the Canadian Peace Research Association. Uh, now, the topic of uh, this panel is imagining Canada's future. Many years ago. Lord Bertrand Russell, who worked with Albert Einstein and an appeal to humanity. His last book, I think, was called Has Man a Future? I think that is a critical question. And I don't think it has been dealt with today. This is the question. And I think we should address it. If we have intelligence, we should use it. I'd like responses. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
two more questions, and then we'll get a round of responses. So I, I can move that back up. Maybe not. Maybe I can be here if I go down like this. Uh, our, so I want to be positive about this, but but I also find maybe I've just been beaten down by my year. Oh, I'm, I, my name's Leslie Cormack. I'm a historian of science and technology, uh, as well as being a, a dean of arts. And uh, I guess I have three points to make. One is that, Chad, uh, I would challenge you to say that human beings have been the same through history. And so I, I don't think that's right that we've just discovered what human beings are now. We are different than we were before the Reformation, before the Industrial Revolution. And so uh, different institutions get developed for particularly different ways of thinking, and we think we are thinking differently now. I think that to argue that we are now, we now know how human beings uh, think is to fit into a kind of evolutionary psychology model that I would certainly challenge. So that's my first thing. My second is to say that I have uh, two uh, teenage sons, and I look at what they do online, and I, um, I think of Neil Postman, uh, that we are entertaining ourselves to death, that I am not convinced that most of what happens on the internet is solving any of our problems, or they're very good at seeing failed blogs and uh, reading funny things that, that come up and watching YouTube videos of other people playing multiplayer games, uh, but that doesn't necessarily change the world. So that's a danger that we are actually giving people bread and circuses as Rome burns. Uh, I can only use historical examples. My, <laughs> and my third is to say that people are inherently conservative. And if you look at something like Wikipedia, if there's something on Wikipedia which is actually wrong but follows the, the, the way that people think of it, it's virtually impossible to change that. That you can go in and change it and it's back the way it was within 24 <laughs> hours. So again, the internet does not necessarily take us to new places because there is a resistance to that kind of change as well. So those are my three pessimistic uh, points of view. Thank you. Hopefully we can, oh, thank you very much for fixing that. Um, hi, my name is Zishan. I'm doing master's in software engineering from University of Waterloo. Uh, and to actually to pick on um, uh, the last questionnaire's uh, point, I am also skeptical about the bad impacts of technology uh, on the societies. Um, and uh, my question, ab I have, like, why is it that the books that predict bleak future turn out to be right most of the times. <laughs> and, what, 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 and uh, as an example, I would quote 1984 by George Orwell. And we see the impact of technology. It make, it, it's making these corporations and governments more sophisticated in nipping the alternative voices in the bud. Uh, I mean, and uh, I mean, that's why people are skeptical about the governments and, um, and the initiatives actually taken by the governments. And, you know, uh, so, uh, it, I'm, so both of you probably can answer this question. Thanks Thank very you. much. Yeah. So uh, that's true. Margaret Atwood is speaking after this, right? And *Handmaid's Tale* was actually a dystopic scenario of the future. Um, so, any respo uh, responses to the three questions uh, you heard, or comments? Diana, did you want? Um, to I uh, what I wanted to say earlier a little bit, and it's reflected in the questions, is I do think the question of, of participation in this future, whether or not it's positive or negative, what we're all doing online, and, and how much, you know, how we can capture the positive and perhaps sort of filter out the negative. But I worry, uh, I worry about participation. You, you're talking about um, Wikipedia and, and, the, and, and who's doing it. You know, what I think the things that are really important to me personally. Um, do I have time to do to, to contribute my sort of intellectual you know energy? I have four kids, a job. I already run two websites. You know, I I, I don't have time. Um, maybe I could make time, but it, the, the sort of self-selecting nature um, of, of of the future, if we if we rely too much on it, and I, I guess you know experts. The question of experts, you know, what role does the expert have in this new environment? Is not telling people what the uh, the the, the future is, but is somehow trying to bring in voices that are not heard and kind of sift information in an effective way. Um, in terms of the government and, and you know the sort of cynicism of, of whether uh, whether there's a genuine desire to kind of listen, pass, take it up, uh, incorporate views in, I I think I really do think that that, that 
the jury's out at present on that. And I think that that is, you know, we've seen that that is deeply, uh, you know, the conventional roots are being kind of undermined because people are deeply skeptical of, of uh, you know, any ability that, that there seems to be a, a, a lip service to participation and consultations of general uh, things. Maybe it's because they're still in the old mode. They're not really in the kind of new mode, but uh, we invest our energies and, uh, and then they tell us what they thought anyway. Um, so uh, I guess that's something that I see as a, as a, as a long-range project. Um, and maybe it's the institutions that do have to change before we get make a future in that. Thank you. I'll pick up uh, two points. Uh, Neil Postman is a thoughtful guy, and I think he's very wrong. Uh, because he confuses screens. A television is a screen where you're the passive recipient of someone else's video. A computer screen or an iPad or a whatever you're the actor, the initiator, the organizer, the remember, and the effect on brain development is the opposite. And uh, what I find most problematic about him, and th this whole you know, school of people who say that uh, this is the, uh, our children today, the dumbest generation, is the title of a book, how the digital age stupefies young Americans and jeopardizes our future. And this uh, English professor named Mark Bearline, he says, don't trust anyone under 30. Um, <laughs> I've debated this guy a bunch of times. But we've got, uh, you know, Robert Bly and the sibling society, uh, the internet is eating the neocortex of youth today. This is the dumbest. Uh, gener they're, they're net addicted, glued to the screen, losing their social skills. They're, they're Generation Me, that's Jean Twenge in a, uh, a book uh, where she says, uh, we've created a little army of narcissists. All they care about is YouTube and MySpace and Facebook and, 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 and Twitter. They don't care about anything else. They're violent, they're into drugs and alcohol, youth culture and rap and everything is bad. And I mean, it's a beautiful stereotype. The only problem is, there's no data to support any of this. This is not the dumbest generation. Kids are graduating from university like never before, both in terms of uh, raw numbers and a percent of the population. It's never been tougher to get into the best schools. Um, uh, standardized tests, SAT scores, and others should have dropped dramatically. Your researchers, you know, they used, they used to be uh, only for the most elite Students, now they're a mass thing. That should have brought huge downward pressure on the mean. It didn't. Now there's a problem, of course, in the schools. The bottom third are dropping out. But there are real reasons for that. To blame the internet is sort of like, I don't know, blaming the library for ignorance, if you ask me. Um, they don't give a damn. Well, youth volunteering in Canada is up year over year for 15 years. They're violent. Youth crime is down year over year uh, for 15 years. Uh, they're losing their social skills. Actually, time online is taken away from time watching TV. Now you can say, well, television was the electronic hearth and it was social and we all sat around. Well, I don't know about your family, but pass the popcorn grunt, you know, or give me the remote was hardly a meaningful kind of uh, collaborative experience. We can be enormously hopeful about this generation. They have very strong values and they're wonderful overall. And technology within a good family and with, it, with balance is, is good for them. But we fear what we don't understand. The second thing I'll say, and I'll be much briefer, is that you know the traditional media, originally the printing press, but the radio, television broadcast of the industrial age, and even the early days of computers, it was centralized. It was one way. It was controllable. Um, and you know what, what they said, freedom of the press is a great idea, especially if you own a press. Um, and uh, the people out there were passive. Well, the new media is the antithesis of all of that. It's not centralized. It's highly distributed. It's not one to many. It's one to one. And it's many to many. People are active. And, and as such, it, it has this awesome neutrality. It will be what we want it to be. And if we want it to be a platform to uh, find a cure for AIDS, it'll be that. If we want it to be a platform to organize against public education, as the Tea Party is doing, it will be that. If we want it to be a platform to commit horrific acts of evil, as some people are doing, it will be that. And w which is, to me, my bottom line is, which is why we all need to get involved and not mistrust this thing or predict that it's going to be bad. Get involved, embrace it, get active, use it to change your organization, your family, uh, uh, whatever. And if we do so, then 
I think this, this new age that we enter into will be one where we can fulfill the promise and more peril is uh, uh, unrequited. Uh, very quickly, in reverse order, uh, bleak predictions turn out to be right. I reject the premise utterly. Uh, the research indicates that uh, optimists and pessimists are about equally accurate, which is to say they're not. Uh, 1984 wasn't really a prediction. It was a social commentary in, on 1948. But we'll say it was a prediction. Well, that's fine. What happened since 1984? Democracy and freedom have flourished since then. Uh, by any indicator that you choose to measure, there is more freedom today in humanity than ever before. Um, Technology. I'm quite prepared to accept the possibility that information technology can have deleterious effects if it can be shown. There's lots of good theoretical reasons to think it can have. But even if it is shown, so what? Every technology since the invention of fire has had a dual-edged nature. You know, fire, you could cook your meat or you could burn down your hut. It, <laughs> it's all in how you use it. It's a good uh, point. And finally, has man a future? I would note the question mark on the end and I'll give you your answer. Your answer is maybe. <laughs> I don't know. That's true. And the late, the, the landmine treaty, you know, was wasn't, or was it the, one, I think it was the landmine treaty, was sort of organized through this social media movement. So there have been some, I think, positive steps towards a more peaceful future, I hope, uh, through some of the use of this technology. So next three questions, please. Hi, David Phipps from York University and Research Impact for Canada's Knowledge Mobilization Network. We join voices, academic voices, with non-academic voices, and that's going to be my question. I want to join comments of Dan and Dan. Um, by removing 100% confidence or embracing um, uncertainty, we get the inevitable recommendation in many of our reports is we need more research in. <laughs> Whatever. Um, and, um, but scholars do bring value to this debate. Um, but that debate needs to be in term, framed in terms of collaboration, the other Dan. So uh, embracing different knowledges. So my question is, what is the value that academic scholars bring to the future debate? And what gaps would exist if they were left to do it alone? Thank you very much. And by the way, it's Dan and Dawn. So just to Sorry, Dan. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Nilofar. I am uh, a PhD candidate at the Center for Cross-Faculty Inquiry at UBC, and my project is about ethics and philosophy. I have a number of things to raise, and um, there, there are some questions. The first one is that there were the, um, the things about the experimentation and also the networking raised here. But there, and, uh, there was the talk about the different risk. But the risk of the chaos was not addressed. It's not the risk of uncertainty. It's the risk of chaos that can come w about with the networking that you addressed about the, this collaborating projects and uh, how to deal with that. And the second thing is, I think the ethical risk of our imagining the future was not addressed at all. Uh, we should not forget that Canada, being the sister of the United States and the affiliated with the British Empire, was, has been a colonizing force. So what's the ethical risk of imagining the, the future that you, you want to build? And that's very important, this ethical risk. And then there is a thing about the nation states and the industrial model, which I, I agree a lot. But one thing about the, this model is the metropoles we have and the concentration of the uh, population and things that are related to the population in one spot. So how to address these kind of things with the new model? And another thing, again, about the old model and new model is the uh, speed and return. Um, you know, there are a lot of problems with the health and other issues because the new rhythm, it seems that this new technology of the networking and the uh, speed, uh, the human being has hard time to cope with that and also has hard time, people have hard time to cope with being mobile all the time and changing the places and going to somewhere else and live somewhere else. So I want to say that, you know, yeah, there are these leaders of organizations or like big thinkers, gatekeepers who 
are resisting the change or the paradigm scientific change. But there are also ordinary people, you know, who cannot cope with many things that are happening and, you know, what will happen to them, you know. Okay, thank um, you. Yeah. And the, the, the last thing, I don't think the par paradigm, uh, I disagree with you, I don't think the paradigm of future is networking, it's the paradigm of today. The, n n the future is new neuroscience and biological manipulation and all these kind of things that was not addressed here at all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and a third. Uh, David Holton from Shirk, and I have a question from Twitter. Uh, let's see if I can get this microphone adjusted. Uh, it's specifically addressed to Diana Carney, but I'll pose it to the whole panel. Uh, it comes in from Public Intellect, and the question is, to what extent has the Occupy movement raised the profile of the income inequality debate? Thank you. Okay. Lots of grist for the mill. Role of academics, ethics and philosophy, chaos, ethical risks, urbanization, neuroscience. Uh, what was the last one you just said? Oh, yes, uh, the Occupy movement, sorry. <laughs> Do you want to start? I'll start with it. I think I have the easiest question. Um, uh, I think clearly it raises it enormously. I mean, we're all, I, I'm not sure how many people really know what the Occupy movement is about and to some extent, or I'm not, some people would argue that the Occupy movement doesn't really know what it's about. But we certainly know that it exists. Um, and I think that's a key, uh, you know, that, that, that is a key thing. Um, you know, we have the profiles in the paper of people and it's not necessarily just the disadvantaged, it's the, you know, it's the educated and it's people who just feel that society is, is becoming increasingly unfair. And I, I do think that, that I mean, if you, see, if you watch the polls of how it's come up in the debate, I think the Occupy movement, even though very small groups of people have actually been involved, I mean, the voice through the internet and other things, the voice that they've had, um, I think has been uh, dramatic, have made a dramatic difference. And we do feel like it's a really a mass movement of, of concern at present, uh, whether or not that is the case. So um, I think that was a fairly, fairly clear. Um, uh, just a couple of the topics. The role of academics. Uh, first of all, I think there's a big role for social sciences and humanities, uh, notwithstanding that I'm a digital guy. Um, you know, when I graduated, I was set for life. You just had to keep up in your chosen field. Today, you graduate, you're set for 15 minutes. And, uh, and what, what counts when you graduate is not what you know. Skills. Well, we need skills, but you know, it's your capacity to think and solve problems and put things in context and understand the interrelationship of things in history and so on, which is why a liberal arts undergraduate education to me is a great way to equip yourself for lifelong learning in a networked economy. Um, but I think that academics are leaders of, typically leaders of old paradigms, both in terms of their fields and also, I, that's a pretty gross statement, uh, but, uh, but especially in terms of the model of pedagogy. So l let me suggest three changes. One is we need to change the model of pedagogy. To me, the lecture is the process whereby the notes of a lecture go to the notes of a student without going through the brains of either. <laughs> now, I appreciate that I gave you a long lecture. <laughs> But I don't know, I talked about Indian institutions. Can anybody remember them? It's not a good way of learning, actually. This is, this is better. Um, so we need to move towards student-focused learning. And that means small group discussions and technology. There should be no statistics lectures. You know, the statistics lecture, by definition, is a bust. No, it's no one size fits all. Everyone in the class is either bored or else they don't get it. Um, so, and it's a better way to learn statistics with computer-based uh, learning and where you get to go at your own pace and test yourself and, and then have small group discussion. That's the first one. The second thing, and um, this is not a veiled uh, critique of Shirk because I don't really know anything about Shirk. I think we need to change the model of research. We have this model that exists where you know, I'm, a, I'm somebody with money or a government agency or, or whatever and I ask you for uh, I put out an RFP or I ask you to submit unsolicited proposals for things and I decide which are the good ones and then I give you money and you go off and do, and don't collaborate with anyone else by the way, and then you go off and you do the research and then you, um, uh, you know, deliver the results and I guess later we'll publish them in some kind of journal where other people get to talk about it. What's wrong with this picture? To me, basically everything. So couldn't we use the network world to move to towards a whole new model? The BC government uh, wanted to 
develop research in software to, de uh, to create applications to fight carbon. And, and was, so rather than doing the old model, they created something called the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Apps for Climate Change Challenge. And they said $50,000 prize. It wasn't even given by the government. It was given by a company for anyone who can come up with the best application to you, uh, use the data that we're giving you to radically reduce carbon. 27 companies all submitted uh, proposals. The winner was extraordinary. I mean, you can, from the, this little app, you can look at the carbon being admitted in your company at any time. You turn off the lights and the carbon goes down. And, but it, it was a way of funding innovation that was the opposite of the old way. There was, there was uh, a, a, a crowd that helped pick who the, who the winners were. And it stimulated a whole bunch of economic activity for a relatively tiny amount of, of, of money. The third thing I think that we need to create or, or change is the way the content gets developed for the university. How bizarre that there are, I don't know, 10,000, 20,000 statistics professors in the world, each creating their own little ways of and PowerPoints and tests and notes, uh, ways of explaining what an analysis of variance is. There's probably one best way or maybe three best ways that are culturally different. And they ought to be software. Why don't we get together with MIT and now thankfully Harvard and open up the content of the university. This is not to, to create statistics content for people in Bangalore that can get it for free. This is about changing the model of how we develop academic uh, content and content uh, uh, for the university. So to me, there are, are three big changes. Just one quick thing on risk and chaos. I think if we don't make these changes, we are risking massive chaos. You take something like the legitimacy of our governments. Young people, we know they have strong values. They care a lot. They're disproportionately affected by this economic mess than any other uh, demographic. They're not voting. It's a weird situation. Half of the world is clamoring for democracy, and the half that has it Young people think it doesn't work. And there's a crisis of legitimacy for our governments that's emerging. Governments are, st or, or young people are starting to go around governments to find new ways to create social change. And whether that's, um, you know, what, what happened with the Arab Spring, the internet drops the transaction and collaboration costs, not just of innovation and production, but of dissent, rebellion, and even insurrection. Occupy, you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think Diana's right. You, you, can, you can write this off as a bunch of radicals and hippies and anarchists and losers and so on, but this is reflective of a very deep and growing concern in society that the world is becoming more unfair and Wall Street and the financial services industry and powerful people um, are, are at the heart of this. You know, just to really stir things up, I don't think the whole Quebec upsurge is about tuition fees. I think that there's a deep and growing youth radicalization all around the world where we promise young people you work hard, you stay out of trouble, you get a degree, uh, you can have a, a good life. And is that really true? You know, the Tunisian revolution was 40% youth unemployment. It's 45% in Spain. It's 21 in the US. I think it's probably 18 in Canada. So we risk anarchy and massive social disruption if we don't fix these very fundamental problems of our broken uh, institutions. Very quickly, uh, do academics have value? Well, in this process, I would suggest that because I'm sitting on this platform, I have some role. Well, what do I do? All I do is bring academic research to a wider audience. I don't think I've ever had an original thought in my life. <laughs> uh, oh, come on. <laughs> That was a very original type of statement. <laughs> risk, of, risk of chaos, uh, abs ca cascading failure, absolutely, certainly. Uh, if 2001 and 2008 taught us anything is that we have to watch out for the black swan. We all know this, or one would hope that we know this. But the vision that I have, and I think in large part which I share with Don, uh, is this idea of networking. And networking properly done, intelligently done, includes decentralization and experimentation. What does that mean? It means taking it down local, and it means on a smaller scale. Uh, what's dangerous, see that model, if you do that, that experimentation model, you do that and you fail. You will fail because human beings fail. And you can fail safely. You can fail fast and you can fail safely. And you can get on with trying something else. 
What's dangerous is when a politician says, I have the answer, and the politician implements the answer across the system, because then when it fails, everything goes down. And by the way, we have a federal government today in which all important decisions are made by one man. That's insane. <laughs> And last point, uh, ethical risk. Absolutely, there's ethical risk, and I take the point entirely, but remember the dual-edged nature of that word risk. Risk doesn't just mean danger, it means opportunity. If you go to Wall Street and, and Bay Street, they always use risk, but they mean money. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's opportunity as well. Change your thinking, then maybe this is an opportunity. Diana, sorry. I, I, just the one, I, I, I'm no expert in this area, but the one thing that always concerns me, and we come back to you know discussion of Asia and, and, and what's going on there, is uh, you know their education models, as far as I understand them, are very traditional, uh, and, 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 and they seem to be doing well now with that. Um, it, you know, the U.S. still retains the kind of is the, is the innovation center of the world to some extent, but you know it, it does concern me. Uh, you know, are they going to move to our model, or can the two compete, or what happens in that world, and what can we learn from them as well? And I think you know we, this is this comes in in stark relief to us when we have these kind of parenting books about how you're really it's the Asian model that gets us ahead uh, and we should uh, you know forget all this I you know I'm too lazy as a parent for that but um, uh, no I mean how do we get the best out of both I think is the, is the real issue. Thank you and I thought the neuroscience comment was very important thank you for raising it I'm not sure we've thought through the implications there was a woman a few weeks ago was it was in the news there was a, a an implant in her brain she was quadriplegic and her thoughts affect the computer chip which affects the robot which then can do things for her and you know this is you think that through in terms of, of what the possibilities are so thank you for making that point two last questions and then we will sum up Hi everyone, I'm uh, a student in the Conrad Business School taking a course called Venture Creation. Um, thank you everyone for the uh, inspiring lectures <laughs> this morning. And I found that one thing I learned is that I, I got inspired and tried to build a lot of things from networking with people and try to uh, absorb their ideas. And I found the ecosystem here is trying to establish already. So looking into history, a lot of major um, accomplishments are led by great people. When great people put together, they have some great minds. And then they put the history uh, moving forward. So uh, my question is, um, is there a way to better you know, help people to fulfill their lives or to find the right people and give them the networking or resources? For example, this morning I was working with Mr. Bosley to, to this uh, hall for like 10 minutes, but I didn't know it was her, uh, it was him, until somebody wanted to take a picture of him. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, if I got the chance, I probably want to network with Mr. Bowsley, right? <laughs> However, like, it might be a risk, I may bring chaos to him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, that's the problem right now with the society. So, people with green mind, they might not get a resource to do great things. And there was a friend of mine in China, he was a great people with green mind but he got obsessed with his life. And five years into you know, working every day and living his own life and got married, he got no passion into changing anything. So like, is there any way to better this situation? Thank you. Thank you, and last question. I, um, I'm Megan Shellstad. I teach philosophy on the West Coast in Victoria, BC. Um, and my concern, like a previous questioner, is uh, with respect to ethics. <coughs> Um, and you haven't said enough to satisfy me, so I get to ask my question. <laughs> uh, and that is sometimes, depending on whether it's a glass half full or half empty day, uh, it does seem like ethics is one area, A, amenable to issues about human nature and, and stuff like that, but it does seem that the same things that, get in the, that used to get in the way are still the same things that get in the way of people doing the right thing, et cetera, et cetera, for at least a couple of thousand years. And, um, and we, it does seem to be less amenable to this kind of progressive, always improving or, or just changing, I suppose, model in a way that we seem to be quite uh, satisfied to keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again when 
we should rightly have learned certain things either from events or from you know, previous thinking or whatever. Uh, you know, the economic collapse, of course, is an excellent uh, ca case study in this. Anyway, so any or all of you comments of optimistic or pessimistic or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, in terms of the Q&A, and maybe you could make some final remarks too, inspiring the young generation and keeping that flame alive, values and ethics, and any closing comments before we invite Dr. Gaffield to wrap up and give the vote of thanks. Who wants to go first? How about you, Dan? Oh, uh, the first question, if, if I take it, I mean, this is more your bailiwick. I think it's, it's basically improving, improving networking. How, how, how do you get in touch with those folks that you want to get in touch with? How do you, how do you improve the exchange of ideas, that sort of thing? Oh, no, not really. I mean, like, <laughs> there are people that their minds are not fully explored. For example, take me as an example. I wouldn't know this if I don't talk to those people, so I wouldn't find there's something in me that can maybe change the world. So like in terms of the future of Canada, maybe we need to inspire those people and find a way to do that, first find the people first. Right, uh, so you, you're, you're describing serendipity essentially, right? Um, I, 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 I don't know, I, I can only speak from my own experience from, from Twitter's wonderful, a wonderful demonstration of this. I was always a Twitter skeptic. I thought people were always talking about what they had for lunch. And then I, and then, and I actually spent, you know, 30 seconds with Twitter and the light bulb went on. And it's an astonishing, astonishing tool because, because you have this enormous range and the range is basically as, as wide as you want it to be. And if you have enough interaction, eventually you start to sift. At first, you're starting to sift by titles. Well, this is an impressive person. Oh, I know this person. That's an impressive institution. I'll have to pay attention to that. But eventually you stop doing that because the responses that you're getting, you realize that this person who has no title and you don't even know who this person is, has been consistently providing you with good information. Uh, and, and, and so you develop this whole new network, which is entirely based around, it's almost randomness. It's very close to randomness. It's pretty, pretty inspiring. Thank but, you. but you've got, I mean, I think the, the question was, you know, there's people who are not doing that, who do have something to say and who are not part of the conversation, if, I, if I'm correct. And, is that what you're saying? Um, I think, yeah, partially. Partially, OK. Um, and uh, you know, that, as I said, I mean, that, that concerns me. So how do we you know, make sure that we are actually getting the best out of this, this system? And then that person, not, not that you just find them on Twitter, but they're actually on Twitter in the first right. place, sort of putting their thoughts out there. Um, and to me, it's a, it's a huge issue. Participation has always been a very sort of distorting function. Um, and uh, you know, can you educate people to participate? Maybe I don't know. And Don, I'm I'm on Twitter because uh, one of my reverse mentors uh, four years. Do you have reverse mentors? No. Best thing ever. Maybe, um, maybe you could define that for us. Well, it started uh, <laughs> it started for me in the mid '90s when. Um, it was actually 1997, I built my website, growingupdigital.com, and it was a company called Kids Energy, and the project manager was a guy named Michael uh, Furtick. He was 13 years old. They made him the uh, project manager because he was the oldest. <laughs> and, um, and so, and I would learn so much from Michael on that project that I asked him if he would mentor me. And um, then I, I, I have to, uh, a number of, structured kind of mentor relationships. And now it turns out I have something to say to them as, as well. Uh, one of them is in this room, Dan Herman, he used to uh, work for me for a long time. And uh, so I sat down, this is a friend of my daughter's actually four years ago, and she said, Don, you gotta be on Twitter. And I said, I don't wanna be on Twitter, Twitter's stupid. And she said, come on, you're Don Tapska, you have to be on Twitter. I said, I said, I can't say anything in 140 characters, as you've seen today. Um, and uh, she says, come on, I'm going to, so she set me all up. Now, I'm no Ashton Kutcher, but, you know, I have 35,000 people. I wrote macroeconomics largely on Twitter, interacting with people, asking them. Uh, uh, stuff. I'm just uh, working on this project about the governance of the internet and I, I put out a tweet um, yesterday about who are the best people to do research on this. I'm getting a ton of great ideas. It reminded me I should get a hold of Vince Cerf and get him involved in the thing. But, um, and Twitter's my newspaper now. 
because uh, I've curated, you know, I have my economics people, my political people, my Don Tapscott's innovators, the best innovators in the space, and I have the people who are talking about me because I want to know what, what they're saying, my personal friends, and, and, and so on. So anyway, that's the point I wanted to make was about ethics. And I'm enormously optimistic. And the reason is because I think transparency is now a powerful new force. Um, and sunlight is the best disinfectant. I mean, institutions, companies, organizations everywhere are becoming naked because people can scrutinize them now. They can find out what's going on. They can form others. They can organize collective responses. They can create mass movements, whatever. And our institutions are becoming naked. And if you're naked, well, there's some corollaries from that. I mean, one is fitness is no longer optional. Um, or, you know, or if you're going to be naked, you, you better get buff. And um, meaning you need to have good value because value is evidence like never before. But you also need to have values. And, and the questioner said doing the right thing. To me, that is integrity. It's about being honest, considerate of the interests of others, abiding by your commitments, doing the right thing. And in the past, you know, there are all these corporate social responsibility site uh, people who said, had they had this expression, you do well by doing good. And I don't think it was true. I think lots of companies did well by being bad, by being monopolies or having terrible labor practices in the developing world, externalizing their costs on the society, whatever. But increasingly, because of transparency, the sunlight is causing companies, governments, and other institutions to change. And it may not seem like that when you see all the terrible behavior that still exists. But we know for sure you do badly by being bad. Wall Street kind of learned that. Um, and, and I'm very optimistic that integrity, which is the foundation of trust, that's what trust is, the expectation that another party will act with integrity, um, is on the rise because trust is a sign of quantum for this whole network world. And if you don't have integrity baked into the bones of your institution, increasingly you'll be unable to build trusting relationships and you will fail. So I, for the people who care about morals and ethics, these are the halcyon days to me, that things are changing. It's not because of governments telling us to change. It's because people have to change to be effective and to perform well. Non, j'aimerais inviter notre président de, de dire le mot de remerciement. Quelle belle séance. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, just a terrific. Hey, I want to give a special word of thanks uh, à nos amis de la, la Fédération. Uh, Graham Carr, the president of the Canadian Federation of Managed Social Science, is with us this morning. And just take advantage of his presence and, and many uh, colleagues at the Federation just for this super congress. It's been terrific, and we all... We all really, really appreciate uh, all your work, uh, University of Waterloo, Wilfrid Laurier University. You know, Social Science Humanities Research Council, we do feel that uh, the increased focus on the importance of understanding human beings is, is pretty key. And in terms of why foresight, why have we embarked on this initiative, you know, when you look back at our history at, at SHIRT, we have some pride. Uh, in 1980, for example, the Shirk uh, with some colleagues identified aging as a really important topic, and at that time, it was not really uh, headlines. Uh, and through a research done by scholars across disciplines, uh, in the last couple, a few decades, uh, we significantly enhanced uh, how we think about that, whether it's elder care, uh, whether it's uh, different forms of uh, new ways of thinking about retirement, and, and so on. Uh, Canada aged during the 18, uh, 1980s and 1990s a world more successfully than was anticipated. Everything dealing with pension plans and, and so on. Obviously, we need to keep going, but I think uh, there's some, uh, uh, it's a good example. Another one uh, uh, project was got together at the start of the 21st century about the humanities. Uh, uh, some of you may remember Humanities 2010. Uh, that really began thinking about that led to us at SHIRT developing the Image Tech Sound Technology Program, for example. As a result of that, uh, Canada is now leading the world in terms of the development of the semantic web, textual analysis, on and on. Uh, and I think that's really, really exciting. And in terms of our programming, along the lines of what uh, Dom was suggesting, we in fact have transformed our program architecture and Giselle 
introduced the great phrase creative open spaces in terms of thinking about that collaboration across disciplines on and on and, and so I think we have a shirt I think we have a role to play with all of you the word that we use a lot it's come up today engagement and I think it's through engaging uh, and we're certainly so proud to be here. Giselle Tedes de Vood, who's really the champion of this dossier, is here, uh, colleague Brent Herbert Copley, and so on. And I think we see this as a great opportunity to engage. Happily, it's just the start today of a, of a, a tripart conversation uh, that we invite you to. Uh, in this building at 1.30 today, we're going to be focusing on a session called uh, What Will Canada Look Like in 2030? Building on some of Diana's uh, uh, project's work and so on. The editor of The Walrus is our moderator for that, John McFarlane. And we're bringing together a number of Canada research chairs. I see Michelle Boutin in the back, our, our champion of the CRC program. And, and some voices, some student voices and so on. And, then, and we look, invite you all at 1.30 in this building, a little card to uh, suggest. And then tomorrow we're going to focus specifically on the digital economy, digital partnerships, the new cultural changes and so on that are going on, this question of values, on and on, and how does that work, the cross-campus community and connections and so on. Jerry Sinclair, our council member and one of the pioneers in Canada, uh, will be there um, among others, and we invite you to that at 9.30 uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, again, uh, in, in, the dining, uh, in the dining hall. So let me close, encore une fois, de vous remercier d'être venus et vous qui sont peut-être de brancher avec nous. And thank you for those questions. I want to say how thrilled we are uh, that the three of you joined us this morning. We were thinking about who could really engage us and really help us think through this. Um, we were just overjoyed, uh, and Dan Gardner, and, and again, I know in Ottawa we're blessed because we get to uh, uh, really read him often, but across Canada and through the internet, please, I invite you uh, to, to stay tuned. And tonight, as if tonight as well, uh, a really super occasion to hear more from Don Tapscott in a, in a wonderful event where he'll be focusing um, on his, on his uh, thinking through in terms of macro uh, wiki economics. He's going to be focusing on the on research in the world of social sciences and social change in the age of social media. Um, that's at 7 p.m. tonight uh, at the University of Waterloo Theatre of the Arts and you're all invited to that. That's a public session and, and that'll be very, very exciting. Please stay tuned. Diana Carney, as she was saying, uh, Canada 2020 is continuing. Uh, and will be part of that new world of engagement. Alors, encore une fois, félicitations Giselle et tout le monde, Ursula Goebel, uh, et à la prochaine.